So I figured we'd start with Anita Racine. Who is Anita Racine? And break that down for people. Yeah, Professor Anita Racine changed my life. There's been so many people along the way that have just changed my life. I think if anybody um, wanted to take anything away from this podcast, whether you're listening or watching, it would be, um, it's okay to ask people for stuff. It's okay uh, to be nice to people because um, at the end of the day, people make you who you are. Nobody, go nobody goes through life alone and gets everything done alone. You need people around you that are in your corner, that are coaching you, that are lifting you up. And Professor Anita Racine, she met me after attempting, after I attempted to get into Cornell four times and got denied. Four times. I actually was going to Cornell as an extramural student. I was taking uh, three classes each semester. I was doing well. I showed that I could handle the workload. They were not having it. They were not accepting me. And um, my, she, my mom taught Anita yoga in Ithaca, New York. And she was willing to meet with me before I packed it in and quit and just figured I could not, I, I just wasn't a, a, a college student. I figured maybe, maybe I wasn't like all the other kids. Maybe I couldn't do it. And she sat me down and she said, Joe, I see your grades are pretty good. She said, you know, I run the textile department at Cornell and, um, I didn't really know what a textile was when she was explaining it. She said, I have 92 women in the department, but no men. And we want some diversity. Do you like textiles? And I said, I love textiles. <laughs> so she accepted me into her program. Um, and I, it's tr it was a tremendous program because one side benefit is, um, and I tell everybody this, um, if I watch a movie, no matter what period that movie is from, I can tell based on women's hemlines. So I, I, I tell everybody that, and it's true. Um, but, it, but it was a great program. I learned, I learned so much. I would do it again if I, if I could. Yeah, so I want to come back to Cornell. But before that, I want to talk about your childhood. In, in your book, you wrote, I could have reacted to the abuse I experienced as a child by becoming a bully. Instead, I became an athlete with the honor and the experience of a Spartan. Why do you think you went the route of Spartan as opposed to bully, what contributed to that? I think I think I was just, I, I think I was just lucky. My mom um, was into yoga. She was into meditation. She was into health food. She just guided me away from um, the bad stuff. And I think if I um, didn't have that guidance, I would have went the wrong way in life. How has your mom's meditation yoga background played a role in, in your life? Well, that was one way, right? I mean, she got me to reconsider sausage and peppers and uh, chicken parm sandwiches and cannolis. Um, she got me into yoga. She got me into meditating. She got me into uh, considering cold showers, positive thoughts, all these crunchy, hippie, bohemian concepts back in the 1970s. But um, now they're at the forefront. You know, now there's a Whole Foods. Now there's a yoga journal. Now there's kombucha people drink. Um, she was brewing it in the house before uh, anybody knew what it was. So she just opened my mind up um, to a different way. So I, I look at all my friends that I was growing up with in the neighborhood. Um, even today, they're still going to jail. They're still getting in trouble. Um, it's not that many yogis going to jail. There's a few, <laughs> not that many. Yeah. So let's take it back now to running the pool cleaning business. And you're 20 years old and you're making a lot of money. How do you not let that get to your head? It wasn't enough money. Mm. I, um, the pools I was cleaning, the houses I was doing construction on, they were massive mansions. They had um, big cars, lots of cars in the driveway. One pool I used to clean had a, had a bridge over it on the ocean. Um, wow. So I, you know, I was making money, but I was looking at that and saying, well, how do I, how do I get to this level? How do I someday get a house with a bunch of cars and a bridge over my pool? Um, and, and, and to be able to hire somebody like me to clean the pool. So, um, it never really got to my head. Um, I, I wanted more. I wanted, I wanted to be like them, you know? So did one of the ways in which you tried to give yourself more was the illegal fireworks business? Well, the illegal fireworks business actually was, was uh, pre-teens. I was very young. It was before the pool business. And um, I didn't know any better. 
I wanted, I wanted to make money. And I could buy a pack of firecrackers, firecrackers for a penny. And I, I, I might've, I, I, I think I sold them for two pennies or three pennies. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was still a 300% markup. But then, then when I moved to Ithaca, New York, because my parents got divorced, I was able to buy them for a penny. I think that was the number and then sell them for a dollar. Wow. I mean, that was like a hell a, of a markup. That was like a Bitcoin trade, right? That was <laughs> un, unbelievable. And, um, I remember filling my uh, piggy bank in, in my room. Actually, my piggy bank was my speaker. My speaker had a hole in it. I was just stuffing money in the speaker every day um, because I was getting all these dollar bills from everybody. The packs of firecrackers were only, I think, I think they were costing me a penny. And um, I didn't realize it was illegal. I got in trouble for that. What'd your mom say when she was in. She found out. She was in India on a retreat. Her brother, my uncle, was there, and he was furious. They threw me out of school. They threw me out of school for two weeks. And did that stay with you? That like I don't want to, I don't want to hurt the the law, or I don't want to go down that route. You know, my dad was awesome. My dad, I'm talking to him on the phone. He says, "Listen," he says, "It's okay to sell and buy and do business. Just make sure you do it legally." Like what mm. else could you sell in school? You're clearly good at it. And so then I started selling gum, chewing gum. And um, it just wasn't um, as big a business. It didn't have <laughs> margins. And so it just didn't feel as good, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. And what was the pool cleaning was the next thing? What was the next thing in your evolution? It was, it was fireworks, gum, and then... What was the next thing? And, and then swimming pools, swimming pools from my teenage years through my early 20s. And then I sold that business and I went to Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I built a business on Wall Street and I sold that. And then I bought a farm. I bought a farm, met my wife, bought a farm in Vermont, bought some chickens and goats and um, we had some kids. And okay, so, so sorry to cut you off. Going back to the college years and how you got into uh, the investment banking, Talk a little bit about Judge Al and the $140,000 check with syntax. You know, you got, you did your research. So, um, so Al, my buddy, Al Capucci, he and I get to know each other and I am, um, taking a class with professor Ben Daniel in the graduate school at Cornell. And we have a challenge to come up with a business plan, present it to the judges and the winner is going to get $5,000. I win, I win the award. And um, I get to know Al Capucci, we become friends. And he asks me, what are you gonna do when you graduate? And I said, I'm gonna go back and run my business in Queens. He said, you're an idiot. He said, you clearly have something, you need to go to Wall Street. And so, um, so I didn't really know much uh, about Wall Street other than the 1987 crash, but I considered it. Went back and ran my business anyway. Every month for four years, Al called me in Queens and he said, what are you doing? When are you gonna get to Wall Street? When are you gonna get to Wall Street? And he drove me crazy. And then finally, um, he called me one day and he said, hey, why don't you buy a stock? If you don't understand what I'm trying to tell you, I'm gonna give you a stock pick. You go out and buy it. You're making money, you're single right now. And uh, between him, he and another friend of mine convinced me to spend $140,000 on, um, 10,000 shares of a $14 stock called Syntax. The day after I bought it, it was my first trade ever, opened up an account, bought it. The day after I bought it, it got taken over. Uh, the company wow. got taken over. I made $100,000 and um, I was hooked. That was, that was better than selling fireworks. What did Judge Al see in you that made him keep calling over and over? I think just that like, that energy level, that, that salesmanship, that aggressiveness, that um, relationship built. Like I, I just give off energy, right? You, and, and when you meet people in your organization or in your circle that give energy rather than take it, like a cold shower gives you energy. A hot shower sucks the energy out of you, right? I'm, I'm very much like a cold shower. That's, that's, that's what I am, I give energy. How do you find people now, with your organization, you've, you've employed so many people. How do you find people with high energy to surround yourself with? You try to find them. Uh, they're not easy. They're a needle in a haystack. But you get those high energy folks. Uh, you want them. Yeah. 
And and is there anything you use to identify to say like, okay, this is someone who pulls me in? Are there any traits that you found? Um, we, you know, adaptability. Somebody's got to be, they can't be rigid. Um, they've got to be, they have a great attitude, no assholes, right? Um, they've got to be full of energy, tireless, uh, resilient, gritty, all, all the buzzwords uh, you would think associated with Spartan. Um, they got to be able to go, you know, the extra mile, 24-7 type person. Uh, no one else really survives here. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it's like in Sparta, Greece, 2,500 years ago. You got to imagine it was a certain personality type that was able to survive with a shield and a spear and a lot of fighting. So you're obviously, your whole brand is is built around Spartan and being that Spartan. Not everyone wants to be a Spartan. How do you sell that? to somebody who is on the couch. Everybody wants to be a Spartan. They're, they're, in their heart. In their heart. I don't know, yeah, I think, I think in their heart. I'm trying to think, is it in their heart or in their mind? But I think, I mean, just look at people walk into an airport uh, newsstand and look at the covers of the magazines and the Spartan looking men and women and how everybody's neck turns to those people. Like, and think about the movies that do so well, right? People love movies where there's that person that just fights against all odds and gets it done. So I think somewhere in their ethos, in their body, in their mind, they want to be a Spartan. They don't want to do the work. Most people don't want to do the work required to be a Spartan. But who doesn't want to look good? Who doesn't want to feel good? Who doesn't want to be a badass? Who doesn't want to have a chest that's puffed out? And, like, Everybody wants to be that. Who doesn't want to be a CEO? Who doesn't want to be a great parent? Like, who doesn't want to win a gold medal? Everybody does. And so it's an attitude. Um, but, you know, to, to have that attitude, to have that persona requires uh, discipline, requires a lot of daily habits, uh, eating well, working out, um, taking cold showers, going to bed early, like, requires work. And, and not everybody wants to do the work. And so they, they become a result of their daily habits. Are you nervous or have you thought about the idea that, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work, right? That's like a common idea. But what are, is Spartan simply appealing to the 20% who are going to do the work for the other 80%? Look, 7 billion people on earth. You know, I'm not going to get all 7 billion people to do the hard work, I'd be lucky to get 100 million people. So my, my goal, our goal is to target those 100 million people, get them cleaned up, and then hopefully they inspire um, the rest of the world. So a lot, of, a lot of people have been saying to me over the years, like, why would I do that? Why would I do something hard? Why wouldn't I just stay? Well, we got a little taste of the result of sitting on the couch and watching Netflix and eating shit food. We got shut down for a year. Hmm. You know, uh, COVID, it's coming out now. It's obvious, it should be obvious to fucking everybody, affected the overweight and the obese and the unhealthy, unhealthy with lifestyle diseases, diseases that are preventable, affected them more than everybody else. So if you didn't take care of yourself and you were overweight, you eat like shit and you don't move your body, COVID fucked you up. What's something you've changed your mind on in the past year? I should probably hug more. Hmm. Probably got to give more hugs. Not much of a hugger. <laughs> so is that something that you you practice with your children, with your family, with your... I'm trying. I'm really trying. Why do you think it's so difficult for you to give hugs? It feels like a sign of weakness. You know? I think, I think that's a, a mistake that we're making as a society where men aren't leaning in to love and kindness. And you can be the Spartan, you can also love. And I think it's important to mix both. I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you one of my shortfalls, uh, but I, I agree with you. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> so you created this camp for your children this summer. This is one, something you sounded really excited to talk about. Oh my God, I love the camp. This summer, we're doing it again. Are you? Yeah. It's 14 days of hell. It's the hardest, it's the hardest 14 days um, any adult, any child, most adults that came to try to do the camp with us, 
they quit within the first five, 10 hours max. Um, the kids, most of them made it 14 days. We'll do it again this year. It's basically like signing up for Marine, you know, Marines Recon or, or Navy SEALs or Delta Force. Uh, it's boot camp times 10. Uh, kids are waking up early. They're getting in cold water. They're getting yelled at by a mountain warfare drill sergeant. Um, they've got to carry rocks up and down the mountain. They've got to eat less and less food with every meal. They got to wake up earlier and earlier every day. Uh, it's just absolute ass kicking. What did your kids say to you at the end of that? Oh, my kids live that way. My kids, they, they, this is just normal for them. And a lot of the oh, folks okay. I look at, uh, my kids are smiling. So uh, they have no choice. They know that this is what we do. Did you just have that in them at a young age to lean into discomfort? I'll put it in perspective with one quick story. My four-year-old son, my second son, Charlie, um, it was Christmas. He was being a pain in the ass. And so I left him a note from Santa. And the note basically said, Charlie, you weren't listening. I ran out of time. All your presents are on top of the mountain. So Charlie, in his little feety pajamas, had to put his boots on and climb to the top of the mountain with me through waist deep snow and uh, to get his presents. So that's been their life. How did he feel when he got the presents at the top? Good. Of course it felt good. We were breathing fresh air. Everybody should have to go get their presents on top of the mountain. Yeah. We and that's Christmas. Christmas. It's too easy. Christmas. We need to toughen people up. Santa should not leave presents in your living room. He should, he should leave them at least one mile away. Mm. It's an interesting idea. It's the reason why my background and logo for this podcast is a guy looking up at a mountain because every day we face that mountain every day. We're looking up at that. And you know, you face that mountain so many times in your life in one week, you did the Vermont 100, the Badwater Ultra and the Lake Placid Ironman in one week. And people look that up. Where does your self-talk go in those races? Where is, is your mind at? What is, what is going through Joe DeSena's head? I mean, I say to myself things like I should take up ping pong. I can't believe I'm doing this <laughs> again. <laughs> I, um, it hurts, but, but I've got a, a chant. I've got a little mantra that works for me and it could work for everybody that uses it, which is, um, it could be worse. This could be the great depression. I could be out on the street. I could be missing a leg. I could be living in Siberia. I could not have the wonderful family I have. And I just go through that. Like whenever I'm feeling pain, I'm like, this sucks, but it doesn't suck as bad as, right? And, and when it gets really bad, I say, well, I'm not dead because dead sucks. So I've just always got perspective on what could be worse. And when you do that, it makes the current situation that much better. As opposed to, think about the flip side, as opposed to, I wish I was playing ping pong with my buddies drinking beer on the beach. Because if you're, if you're comparing your situation to that, you're never going to be happy. And so I always go the other way. And it gives you gratitude, right? Gratitude for the moment that you're in and appreciating yeah. it. Yeah, I get gratitude. I get to say, I get to do this. This is awesome. It's a bunch of people don't even get to do this. Do you ever feel like I'm not, I'd rather die than not complete this? Is that, do you ever go to that place? I do. I, um, I purposely go out into the public and say that this is my plan. This is what I'm doing. It's going to suck. And so I'm embarrassed if I don't, if I don't complete the mission. Mm -hmm. right? I always put my, my neck on the line. You've said that if you were president, this would be your plan. Burpees between classes for all kids in school, banning all plastic bottles, massive sugar and junk food tax, free yoga for everyone, maybe even mandatory. Mandatory one day a month fasting and a mandatory 18-year-old rite of passage. My question for you is, what does that rite of passage look like? Did, did you mention, um, I'd also want all hot water heaters disconnected. Add that to the list, because I want cold showers for everybody. Um, the mandatory rite of passage, uh, everybody should do one year in the military. And, um, and for doing so, we're going to pay for a part of your college. Now, somebody might respond and say, Joe, they already have ROTC. Um, a lot of folks don't want the long commitment. 
They don't want to do five, six years in the military. So let's just do one, one for one. Do this year in the military, we'll pay for your college. Do two years, we'll pay for two years. Do three years, we'll pay for three years. Let's do one for one. You decide. And, and, um, and at a minimum, if you want to live in America, you don't have to, you can move. At a minimum, if you want to live in America, you got to do a year. You got to do some tough shit. Because I don't want you flipping out when Wi-Fi doesn't work on the airplane. And so when Wi-Fi doesn't work, you're going to say to yourself, at least I'm not getting yelled at by that drill instructor three years ago like I was, right? So everybody should do something tough. You've mentioned the president and you've mentioned, do you have any interest in running for office? Well, now that you laid out that wonderful campaign that I could put together, um, I think, I think it's a, I'm a shoe in I think everyone <laughs> in America would love uh, mandated cold showers, mandated yoga, a junk food tax. I can't imagine anybody in America that would push back on a platform like that. <laughs> well, you know, I, I was looking at the election in the last year and I said to myself, you know, we have these two people. I don't feel proud that either of these people are are the person that's going to represent me. Why is it not someone like Jocko Willink? Why is it not someone like Joe DeSena? I think there's enough people in the country who believe that. Yeah, I, I, I'd even join um, Jocko's platform if he needed some help. Um, I agree with you. I'm all for it. Yeah, so one of the, the things you love to say when, when people say to stop and smell the roses is that you're maintaining the roses. Where does that come from? I just thought about it. Everybody's like, Joe, you got to slow down. You got to smell the roses. And I'm like, who the fuck is fertilizing and watering the roses? Like everybody's smelling the roses, right? It's kind of like socialism. Like who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. so like, I, you know, in the neighborhood I grew up, like people were always cleaning while they were talking to you. No one was sitting down and like just eating and not working. Like you eat and work and everybody says all oh, work-life balance. I call it work-life integration. I'm working and talking and doing and all at once. Why, I don't, I don't really understand this sit around mentality. Seems like you've always just been able to carve your own path and do what you wanted as opposed to what society was telling you to do. Where does that come from? I think mom and dad, I mean, think about it. Mom was pushing the envelope in the seventies way outside what was normal. Dad was doing it as well. So I remember one day my dad, said like, hey, they just, they wear their pants just like you do, you know? And it was just one of those things that clicked in my head. And you, he also told me he had gone to a meeting. He didn't, he didn't drink, he didn't like to drink. And he was afraid that the CEO at the meeting was ordering a drink. And so everybody had to order a drink. So he ordered a drink only to find out the CEO ordered water. And wow. so that's when he realized like, you do what you want. Like you, you don't have to kowtow to what other people think um, that you should do. So I guess that's where I got it. One of the things that's so interesting about you and your company is how open you are. You have this standing invitation for anyone to join you at the Red Barn. You, you give people your email. I mean, you are an open fr fellow and you got the email is going off nonstop in this recording. It's like, where did you get the idea to be so open and so willing to just put yourself out there? I think, I think when we hit 3 million fans on Facebook, I just decided to invite everybody in the world to our house in Vermont and my wife lost her mind but the <laughs> good news is three million people didn't show up and so I realized you know I used to give these talks at Cornell for years and I got tired because I would talk to 600 young students and I would give them all this wonderful information and I would say hey if you need any help just get in touch with me and out of the 600 you know I don't know 30 would come down and see me after the, the speech and of the 30 I would give out my email or whatever I was very open and being able to reach me and of the 30, you know, maybe 10 would actually get in touch with me. And of the 10, maybe five would follow up. And of the five, you know, you'd get, you'd be lucky if you got one that was, and so just get, just get tired of, of um, putting yourself out there and, and, and trying to give all this stuff to people and they don't even get after it. So um, I just offer it to everybody because I know that you gotta, you gotta ask 3 million to get, you know, a hundred to get off their ass. <laughs> yeah, it, it goes back to the 80-20 like we were talking about before. I think it's um, more like 98-2. But... 98-2. And are those two the people you're looking for when you're hiring people? Those are the people I'm looking for. Yeah, that makes sense. But those are the people we should all be looking for. 
I got to run shortly, so give me give me one or two more. And I apologize because I actually I actually like the format of this podcast. I appreciate that. What did you learn from sharing a meal with Larry King and Cal Fussman? I learned that these motherfuckers should have ate healthier. You know, like mm. I, I Larry was awesome, but like he was he was pouring you know sugar all over his cereal, and he was saying, ah, "I do an enema every every two days. I don't know why you're telling me to eat more salad." Um, Cal, same thing. I, Cal, I did this whole uh, documentary with. I followed him around and I kicked him in the ass and I tried to get him to eat healthy forever. And he pushed back and he told me, Joe, you got to smell the roses, have some ice cream, blah, blah, blah. Only now to text me in the last few weeks and say, you were right. Wow. You were right, Joe. So they're awesome. They're a lot of fun to be around. Um, obviously, uh, may Larry rest in peace, but like um, people don't listen. Final question. How do you fix a 21 or 22 year old who was given everything in their life? What advice do you have for that person to advance physically, spiritually, mentally? What, what advice do you have for that person? Enlist in the military. Enlist in the military. You can come to the farm if you want. I've had a lot of 20, 21 year olds come to the farm, but ultimately they quit after four or five days. You got to go into the military maybe even like the fucking Chinese military or something, because um, you got to make it so that you can't get out. You got to put in some serious time, get your act together. Um, if you've been given everything and, and uh, you're just a believer that you're entitled to uh, whatever, um, you're hard to fix and it's only going to get worse by the time you're 30. So I would immediately check into the military. Joe, I'm going to get some marks. Thank you, Joe, for your time. I know you're, you're busy. I appreciate you tremendously and well, we'll be in touch. Shoot me an email. And thank you for that. And I apologize that I was late and I apologize I'm leaving early. It's all good. Have a great one. All right. Virtual hug. <laughs> yes. See ya. <laughs>